The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. In 2009, Marist College in New York conducted a survey of some of the most annoying phrases to be used in their day and age in that year, 2009. 2% of people said, at the end of the day, was rather annoying to them. To express finality, at the end of the day. 7% of people rolled their eyes whenever someone would end or begin a sentence with, anyways. 11% of people says, said that it is what it is, ground on their nerves when people ended sentences, it is what it is. 25% of people said, you know, you know what I mean, was the most fr annoying phrase. But even more so than that 25%, nearly half of the people, 47% of the people said, whatever. Whatever was the most annoying phrase. Whatever, as popularized by the movie Clueless, was one of the most annoying phrases. Now for me, well, well anyways, I, I thought it should be like. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I really hate it when people, like, use like whenever they use a sentence like, you know what, anyways, well, whatever. All joking aside, whatever is kind of an annoying phrase, not just because of the fact that it is a word, it's one that's familiar to us, but uh, many of us have heard it used in exasperation. Now, teachers and parents, correct me if I'm wrong, but many youth today will use this phrase, whatever, when they're exasperated with the situation that they feel is hopeless, is out of their control. But it's not just the youth of our day and age, and so I won't pick on them, but they had to learn it somewhere, didn't they? See, they picked it up from, from their parents or from other adults who said things like, it is what it is. Whatever will be, will be, right? We all know these phrases. We may have even used these phrases at one time or another. And we all, at one time or another, have also expressed certain levels of frustrations, even if we didn't use the word whatever. But this whatever attitude is one that is, it seems to be part of our society. In fact, when we think about it, it's, it's not just the word we say, but it is in our very attitude, by our actions and by our inactions. Many people complain about politics, complain about the direction of our country. But there's nothing we can do. Many people complain about the failing morality of our country and our world, and, well, they say, well, one person can't make a difference. Many parents express dismay over the fact that their children and their grandchildren are no longer in church. But their hands are tied. They're helpless. Many Christians express concern over the lack of attendance on Sunday morning. But they're content to be fed instead of to feed. See, this phrase, whatever, and I will use this idea of a whatever attitude, actually is not just, it's not just a phrase, but it is an attitude. And it comes from an attitude of apathy. Now, many of you have probably have heard this word, apathy, before, but apathy comes from two Greek words. Uh, first, alpha, which generally at the beginning of a sentence is a negation, and then the second word, pathos. And we use that sometimes in our day and age, but it literally means a feeling, an affliction of the mind, a passion, an emotion. We talk about people having a pathos, a caring greatly about something. So apathy, a pathos, refers to someone who just doesn't care. Someone who is content to throw their hands up in the air and say, whatever. Someone who looks at the situation and says, there's nothing I can do about it. Someone who looks at our world and says, well, what on earth could I possibly, what difference could I possibly make? And more and more, we do see this I don't care attitude. Again, not necessarily expressed in words, but oftentimes in action or inaction. In attitudes, our own attitudes, sometimes we send that message to other people, whether or not we mean to. And this actually reminds, reminds us of some of Solomon's own words in the beginning of Ecclesiastes. Probably most of you will be able to quote this along with me. Meaningless, meaningless, it says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Wow. Look at where Solomon must have been at that time. As he wrote those words, Solomon must have been in a pretty low spot because not only did he express those words, those th feelings that many of us feel at times, but he actually wrote them in the pages of Scripture. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Wow. Those are almost overwhelming words, aren't they? Especially as he continues on just a little later. And there is nothing new under the sun. 
What a bad attitude. And at the risk of sounding like a heretic, I'm going to disagree with Solomon here. I'm going to disagree with his words in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to say, I don't think that everything is meaningless. In fact, I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to say that having that attitude, having a meaningless, hopeless, whatever attitude, is a sin. But it's not my words, actually. But Scripture itself says, having that whatever attitude, that meaningless attitude, is a sin. James says in the fourth chapter of his epistle, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. In other words, anyone who stands there and watches as someone else sins, anyone who does not engage when they see a problem, when they see someone going down the wrong path, that is sinning. Now we have a theological term for this. This is called the sin of omission. Now we're most familiar with sins of commission, those things that we do, spreading rumors, telling lies, gossiping about other people. Those are sins of commission. But sins of omission are those sins when we stand back. When we say, I'm not going to get my hands dirty. For whatever reason, when we don't engage, when we know someone is sinning, when we know someone is engaging in a, in a, in a sinful behavior, and instead of saying something, standing on and watching. Or, even worse, sins of omission are when God has called us. When he has spoken to our hearts, and we turn our back. When we stand there, and we know that the Lord has promised to be with us. When we stand there, and we know that he, that he has called us to be more than just pew sitters. But do nothing. Those are sins of omission. And by the way, Solomon would agree, although he starts off meaningless, meaningless in Ecclesiastes. As you read through, you'll no discover that it is not life that is meaningless, life that is hopeless, life that we must throw up our hands and say whatever that we have no control over. But he says life without God is meaningless. Life without God is hopeless. If you don't hear any other part of the sermon today, that's the most important part. Life without God is meaningless. Life without God is hopeless. God is our God who has given our lives meaning. He has given our lives hope. He has given us a reason to look at life and say, we should make a difference. We should go out there and tell the world about his love. But this whatever attitude that many of us carry, it's an attitude that is rooted in a lack of trust. An apathetic attitude is one that does not fully trust God, that does not fully trust that He is the Almighty God, the all-powerful God, the omnipotent God, the word we use that word. That, it, that, that attitude, that apathetic attitude is one that is a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But many times, this apathetic attitude, whether it's because we're afraid or because we do say one person can't make a difference, we stand back. We throw our hands up and we say, whatever. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever will happen. There's nothing I can do at the end of the day. And this is a, ultimately an attitude that lacks in hope. Thank the Lord we have a God. Thank Him that He is a God who is not hopeless, who has not thrown up His arms and said, whatever, these people are never going to get it right, but instead thrown up His arms onto a cross and, and allowed them to pound His nails in, who said, whatever must be done, I will do it. That is our God, Jesus Christ, who, who, is, who came to this earth, who lived the perfect life, who said, whatever must be done, and he faced all odds and still defeated death. He faced the trials and the tribulations of this life that we face and still said, no, I need to give these people hope. I need to show these people love. And in that act, he showed his most beautiful act of love. As his hands were nailed into the cross, his, though his words to us in Jeremiah 31 could fully be realized, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you in with loving kindness. 
Because as we know, he did not stay hanging there on the cross. That would have been hopeless, wouldn't it have been? If he would have simply stayed on the cross and eventually died. And, but as he died, he went down to hell and he declared victory. He went down to hell. And he just said to Satan, no, these are my people. These are the ones that I have saved. He went down to hell and came back up in all his glory to take each one of us to himself. And as he reaches out with that loving embrace, he draws us in with his loving kindness. Even though we are sinners, even though we are those who have time and again turned our back on him, even though time and again we have so thrown our hands up in the air and said whatever, he says to us time and again, whatever I must do to bring you to home to me. And in that victory, he swallowed up death. He swallowed up death's power forever and ever with eternal life. And he gave us something to hope in. And not a hope of this world, because the hopes of this world are they are pretty short-sighted, aren't they? The hopes of this world are here today and gone tomorrow. But the hope that he gave us is one of full assurance. That promise of eternal life, that promise that we see in Scripture, in Isaiah 25, in Matthew 22, is a promise that is all throughout Scripture. A promise that is reserved for those who trust, who have hope in the Lord. And as we know that promise, as we know that hope, it's not so hard to read Paul's words in Philippians 4 today. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Say that with me. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Not just some things. Not just part of what, what I should do. But we, our God, we can do everything through Him. He has given us the power that even with faith like a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Paul. Paul wrote these words, and I think probably all of you realize this, but maybe if not, he wrote these words sitting in a jail cell. He wrote these words awaiting the decision of, of his life or death, and yet he still said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He said, Lord, I know that there is nothing I can do without you, but whatever you call me to do, I can do it through you who give me strength. And that is the same promise, not just to the people of Philippi, but that is the promise God gives to each of us today. We can do all things. We can look at our society, a society that has been ruined by sin, a society that has been ruined by death, a society that has been ruined by the powers of the devil. And we can look at it and say, I can do all things. I can make a difference, but not me, but the Lord through me. And right before that, Paul invites us to pray. He invites us to set that example. And he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever of you have re learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, Paul didn't have it easy, did he? Paul's life wasn't perfect in any way, shape, or form. It would have been easier if he would have just sat back and said, great, I have this experience on the road to Damascus, and I'm all set now. But he didn't just sit, did he? He went out. He risked his own life and limb, quite literally, time and again, for the gospel. And he still said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right. He went out there and he shared those things because he saw the need. He heard the need on his heart, that calling of the Lord. That broken heart that loves the, loves the people of this society, that loves the people of our community, of our country, and our, of, of our world so much that he did not want a single person to die without knowing him. His love is everlasting. His loving embrace has drawn us in, and He invites all people to that loving embrace. And you know what's beautiful is that you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a, a seminary professor or a teacher to be the one that He uses. Time and again, God used the weak, He used the meek, and He used the powerless.
to proclaim his greatness. Time and again, God used the old, he used the young, he used the poor, he used them, that we may know the richness of his love. That we may know that he has prepared a rich banquet on the mountain of rich wine, of rich meat, overflowing. That he has prepared the banquet for all. For all who believe. And he has invited us as, our, as normal Christian people, individuals, to share that good news. To go out. To not only be fed, but to feed. To feed people this good news. To feed them the promises of Scripture that are, show so well His great love. For He has loved us with an everlasting love. He has drawn us in with loving kindness. He invites us to draw others in with that same loving kindness. Not by our power, because alone, of course, we could do nothing. But by His power, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have drawn us in with your loving kindness. That you have loved us with an everlasting love. That you saw past the fact that we were broken sinners. That you saw beyond our broken hearts. And instead, sought to heal us. That you reached into our lives. And you did whatever must be done. You said whatever, whatever must be done to save these people. And out of your great love you did. You gave your, your life that we might have life. You gave your life so that not only those who are sitting in pews on Sunday morning might hear the good news, but all people might hear the promise of your salvation. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would call us, that we may go, that we may go and share that good news that we may not tremble in fear, but we may say alongside Paul, whatever, Lord, you ask of me, I will go. I will go, Lord. I will go so that not another person may die without hearing your loving compassion. Lord, fill our hearts with the joy that comes in knowing you. Fill our hearts with the strength of your compassion and fill our lives with your spirit that we may share with great joy your forgiveness. For we know that we can do all things through you who give us strength. Amen.